heritage and toil and greed and prey because he loved me so. He loves me, he loves me, he loves me, this I know, I know. He gave himself to die for me because he loves me so. Why feel the garden's dreadful dross? Why throw his trials go? Why suffer death upon the cross? Because he loved me so. He loves me, he loves me, he loves me, this I know, I know. He gave himself to die for but not only the sacrifice that he made for us, but as we just sang, because he loved us so much. I think back to when the Apostle Paul was talking to the church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter number 11, he says there in verse number 25, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus that same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. For you. Then he goes on to say, Do this in remembrance of me. We continue reading and he says, And in the same manner, he took the cup after supper and saying, This is the cup, the new covenant of my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Verse number 26, for as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we see how much Jesus loved us, that he gave his body, his blood, so that we could be justified, so that we could be reconciled. Let our minds dwell on those thoughts as we partake of the communion. Would you bow with me? Our God and our Father in heaven, we bow before you this morning, offering praise, honor, and glory to your high and holy name. We realize, Father, that you are the great I am. We realize that we must be in a right relationship with you, if we are to have a home in heaven. And we realize that that right relationship comes through the sacrifice of your son Jesus. And that that sacrifice was made through the great love that he had for us and that you had for us. And Father, as we set aside this time and we partake of this bread which represents that body, we just thank you so much for the great love that you had for us. And pray that as we partake, we would do so in a way that would be pleasing in your sight. And it's in Jesus' most holy name that we pray. Amen. you would please bow with me once again. Our Father, which art in heaven, as we continue in this communion with, you, with thee, Father, we thank you for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, that through his life, and especially his sacrifice on that cruel cross at Calvary, we have a fulfilled plan of salvation and have, through obedience, a hope to be with you in heaven one day. And Father, this morning, as we are about to partake of this fruit of the vine, we pray, Father, that for the next few moments, our minds will be on his sacrifice, his blood shed upon that cross at Calvary. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen.
Mark their invitation song for number 744. Number 744. And now we're going to sing, My Jesus, I Love Thee. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee, all the folly of sin I resign. My grace. I guess I get to be the reader too. It's good to see you this morning. I appreciate Brother Allen uh, echoing what Brother Jason said. Uh, when you are preaching to an empty auditorium, you try to visualize people sitting out there, but it just is not the same when people are not there to look back at you. If you will, let's turn our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I want to begin with verse 17 and read verse 18. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. When you are studying the book of 2 Corinthians, and you are reading through chapter 6, and you get to that section just prior to where we are, Paul is talking about the kind of love that the church should have toward him and the kind of love that he had toward them. He spoke often about how wide open our love is toward you. And Paul was wanting them to reciprocate that back toward him. And then immediately, almost just as a burst of information, he says, come out from among them. And you might wonder, why is Paul changing the subject so abruptly, so quickly from loving and now to saying, come out of the world. I'd suggest to you they're tied together because Paul really cares about what's going to happen to the church at Corinth. 
anybody who is a faithful Christian should be concerned if they love the church, they love the brotherhood, about where the church is going to be. Now, there's a challenge here. In fact, what you will notice, there's two worlds and there's two views. There are those people who are a part of the worldly mindset and there are those people who are of a spiritual mindset. And if you really want to know the distinction, it can be summarized under this. Either man is the measure of all things or God is the measure of all things. The Greek mind believed that man was the center of the universe. It all was about man. And we still live in a world today that believes that. It's all about how well you and I find ourselves uh, enjoying this life. What makes me happy? What makes me feel as if I can be fulfilled? On the other hand, you have those spiritually minded folks who are saying, it's all about God and about our service of Him. And so it's a clash of cultures. It's a clash of values. It's a clash of concerns. You see... We live in a world that you have to make a decision about which side you will be upon. But this is not new. In fact, it's really an age-old problem because if you go back to the Old Testament, Amos chapter 3, verse 3, Amos asked the question, can two walk together unless they are agreed? Now, you and I can walk together if we're going in the same direction, at the same pace, going for the same purpose. On the other hand, if you are going one direction and I'm going another, we can't walk together unless we're agreed. But perhaps the best passage I can think of is found in Romans chapter 8, in verses 6 through 8, where Paul draws a strong contrast when he says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. For the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Worldly minded people and spiritually minded people are living in two separate universes. And when you read that, you start saying, well, what is Paul trying to drive home? Well, here's what I want us to do. We're going to look at verses 14 chapter 6 to chapter 7 and verse 1, and Paul will make three very important points. The first one's going to be prohibitions. These are things you are not to do. Number two will be prescriptions. These are the things you are supposed to do. And then number three, the promises that we will enjoy, particularly from chapter 7 and verse 1. Let's begin with verse 18. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. This is both a prohibition and following with it an explanation. And if we start talking about being unequally yoked, you have to go back to the Old Testament and find the meaning of that idea, that term. When Moses wrote the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 22 in verse 10, he said, you shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. That just sounds so plain and so simple. But you've got an ox and you've got a donkey, and he said you don't plow the two of them together. They're two different animals. They're two different sizes. Two different temperaments. They are so contrasting as far as an animal. Yes, they're both a beast of burden, but yet they're different. And God said, I don't want you to plow unequally yoked. You don't put the two together. Can you imagine an ox and a stubborn old donkey? Can you imagine trying to plow with the two of them? And God said, you don't put them together. In fact, in Leviticus 19, 19, he said, you shall not let livestock breed to another kind. You shall not sow your field and mixed seed. You'll not have a garment of mixed linen and wool come upon you. God wanted there to be some clear distinctions, if you will. And this idea of unequal yoke is an Old Testament idea. But in the Greek culture, you often would have schools. And when you had two of the primary teachers, the, the uh, masters, and they didn't di agree on their uh, basic philosophy, they were said to be unequally yoked together. 
You had two different ideas in mind who did not agree. Well, somebody says, okay, I hear that. I hear Paul say, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And thus, I have got to make sure that I just cut off all contact with the world whatsoever. Well, that can't mean that. It can't mean that I choose to be some sort of hermit and go and dwell out in the desert. Throughout history, there have been people who have decided that was the way to solve all of the spiritual problems. Many years ago, the monastic movement, the monks, would go and find themselves in a, a very remote place and stay away from the uh, majority of the people. In fact, you go back even to biblical times, those people who lived out in the desert near the Dead Sea in Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were located. They had separated themselves from society. Is God saying, I want you, my people, to come out and live so separate from the world that you have no contact with them whatsoever? It can't mean that. How can it not mean that? Because if that was true, we'd have to leave the world. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 9, Paul was talking about the church withdrawing from those people who were living sinful lives. And then he went on to explain, I am speaking about the people of the church rather than the people of the world. Here's how he puts it. I wrote unto you in my epistle not to keep company with fornicators. Yet I certainly did not mean the fornicators of this world or covetous, or extortioners, or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. I imagine most of us would prefer to trade with those who are brethren. But if you choose to say, I'm not going to trade with anyone who is not a faithful brother, where will you buy your food? Where will you buy your materials to build your homes? You see, what he's describing here is a situation where you just have to leave the world. So it cannot mean to not be unequally yoked with unbelievers that we've got to just leave the world. But it also would mean that one would then have no influence over converting the world. I think too often we minimize the fact that God has given us a role in this world of reaching the people who are in it. That our lives should reflect uh, the kind of teaching to what people want to become Christians. Let me illustrate it to you. In Mark 16, verse 15 and 16, Jesus said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You go into the world. What do you do? You preach the gospel to them. It's the only way we're ever going to reach these people. Yes, there may be some come to us. There may be some who tune in and listen but the truth is, we've got to go to them. And if I choose to pull myself away from all contact of the world, how will I ever have any influence on the world? In 1 Corinthians 9, verses 20 through 23, Paul says, To the Jew I became as a Jew, that I might win the Jews. To those under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, not being without law to toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. You have to associate with the people of the world if we're ever going to be a positive influence to be light, to be salt, to have a great influence upon them. And I know it also cannot mean that a Christian cannot be married to a non-Christian. Paul addressed this very topic in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. In verse 1 he says, Now concerning the things of which you wrote, there had been a number of items that the church at Corinth had said, Paul, we want you to tell us how these things work, how they uh, come out. And Paul then would answer them one by one. And one of them was, what if I am married to a non-Christian and that non-Christian is willing to stay together and willing to keep our marriage and our home and, and make it what it ought to be? Here's what he says. If a brother or sister has a wife who does not believe and she's willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. 
For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But now they are holy. His point is simply this, that you as a Christian can have impact and influence. Go to 1 Peter chapter 3 and you see the same thing. Here's a godly Christian woman who's married to an unchristian man and she may, by the behavior that she has, reach out and convert that man to the Lord. But then he follows it for what have or what has. He's going to begin a series of things, a series of contrasts, if you will, to contrast a spiritual distinction between those in the world and those in the church and the kind of attitudes that drive those morals. And so he'll take, for instance, what fellowship has righteousness on one side and lawlessness on the other, or what um, agreement has light with darkness or Christ with Belial or a believer with an unbeliever. He said, you look at all these things. They just simply do not go together. Light drives out darkness. Wherever you have one, you have the, the elimination of the other. And now here's the problem. The Corinthians were trying to keep one foot in the world and one foot in the church. And they were trying to compromise and cohabitate, or to use this little bumper sticker that you perhaps have seen recently, coexist with all sorts of religious philosophies. I don't have time to go into great detail, but let me just focus your attention for just a moment back to what we studied in 1 Corinthians chapters 8 and 10. They had written Paul concerning things that were sacrificed to idols in chapter 8 and verse 1. We want to know, is it all right for us to go down to the idol's temple and eat there? Paul wanted them to understand the, the tremendous influence that was going to have on those who had just been converted out of paganism. And you go to chapter 8 and verse 10. He says, if anyone sees you have knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? I want you to notice where here is a Christian who is now sitting and eating in an idol's temple. Can you imagine going to an idol's temple and saying, hey, I think we'll... We'll go there, just like you're going to a, a restaurant that's secular in nature. Get to chapter 10, look at verse 7. And do not become idolaters as some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. You don't want to become too vulgar with this, but I want you to understand that along with the eating the meat sacrificed to an idol was something else. That was the immorality of the city of Corinth, the temple prostitutes. And here's a man who has become a Christian. And Paul would ask the question back in chapter 6. Do you take a member of Christ and join him to a harlot? Well, no, you wouldn't do that. But yet the church has already gotten to the point where they would say, well, we can eat in the idol's temple and we can commit fornication like they were committing. And that's the reason why in chapter 10 and verse 14, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Get away from it. Don't have anything to do with it. You understand the prohibition. Well, what does this really mean? Well, look at the five key terms that Paul will use here in this context. He talks about have fellowship with. And that means to have something together. Communion, that's to be in a partnership with. Accord, the same word from which we get our English word symphony. A par, that is to share ownership in something. And then to have agreement with, to consent or to vote together. In all of this together, the prohibition, Paul is saying, you are not to be unequally yoked. You have a non-Christian and you have a Christian and you have two separate ideas. 
someone says, but what would that look like? Well, if you will, turn with me to the Old Testament for just a minute, and I think I can give you a really good picture of what this would look like. In Nehemiah chapter 13, Nehemiah has returned as the governor over Judah. And he has come back and he is instituting and reinstituting and restoring the worship and the nation and the people and their attitudes. And he is describing for us in detail what has happened during this period of time. He said, on that day, they read from the book of Moses and the hearing of the people, and it was found that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever come into the assembly of God. Now, that's important. God had a limitation on who would be a part of the sacred assembly. Number two, look at verse three. So it was when they had heard the law, they separated from all the mixed multitude of Israel. We, we've had a lot of, of intermingling. Now we've got to separate. You get to verse 4. Now before this, Eliashib, the priest, having authority over the storerooms in the house of God, was allied with Tobiah. Tobiah is an Ammonite. You've got a priest, you've got somebody in God's house in partnership with a man who's not even supposed to be there. Well, now look with me at verse 8. And it grieved me bitterly. Therefore, I threw all the household goods of Tobiah out of the room. And then I commanded them to cleanse the rooms. And I brought them back into them, the articles of the house of God, and with them the offering and the frankincense. You see, you had a building... And there were rooms in that building for storing the devoted items to the Lord. But Elisha said, I guess what, I'll let, I'll let Tobiah have it. If you want a parallel to that, a modern day parallel, all of you know what the Bible teaches about the imbibing in recreational drink of alcohol. But the Bible is very plain about it. Could you imagine... Here comes a brewery who says, we, we need a good place to store some of our liquor. Could we store the basement full of liquor at Bobby Branch? Can you imagine that? That's exactly what they were doing with Tobiah's stuff in the house of God. Well, how bad more had it gotten? Look at verse 15. In those days, I saw the people of Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and loading donkeys with wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them about the day in which they were selling provisions. Men of Tyre dwelt there also, who brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the children of Israel, or children of Judah, and in Jerusalem. What has happened? No longer are, is God's house being used as God's house. No longer is God's day being used as God's day. It's just become a day that they've compromised with the world. And it's no longer uh, the influence of God's people on the world. It's the world on God's people. A couple more things. Let's look at verse 23 and 24. In those days also so Jews who had married the women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab, half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod and could not speak the language of Judah, but spoke according to the language of one or other of the people. Here's what you find, folks. Now the influence is so bad that the children no longer know the language of Scripture. Can it get to the point where we compromise with the world so much that we sound more like the world than we do like God's people? Verse 26. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations there was no king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over Israel. Nevertheless, pagan women caused him to sin. Yes, the world can cause us to sin when we start allowing that in it us to allow it in. And then verse 30, I, I love the way that Nehemiah ends this. 
Thus I cleanse them of everything pagan. He said, you know, there's a time, there's a place when you have to say, enough! The world is not going to have us. And we're not going to be a part of the world and we're going to come out. Now, very quickly, the next two items, the prescriptions and the promises. There are two prescriptions given by Paul. The first one is to come out from among them. And second is let us cleanse ourselves from all defilements of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the sight of God. Now, this may just seem to be two very simple things, but there's a lot in it. The reason being, because if you look in your Bible, you'll notice that's a quotation, and it comes from Isaiah 52 and verse 11, where he says, Depart, depart, go out from there, touch no unclean thing, go out from the midst of her, be clean, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. And you say, well, what's the context? What is Isaiah talking about? When I go back and read Isaiah's message, well, let me just give you a little bit of insight. Isaiah 52 is the chapter leading up to Isaiah 53 talking about the suffering servant of Christ. And thus what this passage is doing is talking about the coming of Christ and everything that goes with it. For instance, all you have to do is parallel Isaiah 52 verse 7 how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the glad tidings of good things with Romans 10 and verse 15. Or you take chapter 53, verse 1. Who has believed our report? Paul quotes that in Romans 10 and verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? They're tying these two ideas together. And thus when he's saying, come out from among them. What is he saying? The church is the called out. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, he says he's called us out of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son or out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see, we are the called out ones. We're the ones who come out of the world and now we're in light. We're not in darkness. Now we're in the body. We're in the church. There's so many passages. I don't have time to review them all, but you go to Numbers 16, 21, 26, Ezra 6, 21, Revelation 18, verse 4. What do you start noticing? Separate yourselves. Depart now from the tents of these wicked men. He said separated themselves. And then in Revelation 18, verse 4, come out from her, my people. What is God asking people to do? Here's the world. He's saying, I don't want you to stay in it. I want you to get out of it. That's the prescription for not being unequally yoked. And then he said, let us cleanse ourselves. Cleanse yourself. Now when you hear that, I know there's a lot of people that say, oh, that grates on my nerve. Because the Lord's the one who does the cleansing. I don't cleanse myself. But there is a sense in which we do. There's a sense in which the Lord offers and has provision for our salvation, but we have to apply it. You know, you may have gotten up this morning to take a shower or a bath, and many of you had soap. But the only way that soap works is if you put it on, apply it. That's the only way the blood of Christ is going to work either. 1 Peter 1 and verse 22, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, you do what the truth tells you to do. Psalm 119 verse 9. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. And it is by the blood of Christ that we do have our sins washed away. 1 John 1 and verse 7. He says the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all our sins. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That means that I have something to do with this. In Acts 2 verse 40, here's Peter preaching on Pentecost. Here's all the people who are listening to what Peter has to say. And they've asked, what should they do? And he said, repent and let every one of you be baptized. In verse 38, verse 40. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them saying, be saved 
from this perverse generation. You've got something to do to be saved. Then finally, God extends the promises that if we will come out and cleanse ourselves, he will be our father and we can be his children. Galatians 3, 26 through 29 says, you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. As many of you as were baptized into Christ, you put on Christ. You go down to verse 29, he says, and if you're Christ, you're of Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's what you get by being a child of God. 1 John 3, verse 1, Beloved, or behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. What a blessing that is. And then Romans 8 and verse 17, If children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, we are able to enjoy the blessings that are offered. The truth is, we live in a sinful world, every one of us. And we come in contact with sinful people every day. And what we must do is not be conformed, allow ourselves to be compromised, to be influenced by and directed by that, but be different. Romans 12, 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, the only way that I can enjoy the promises of God is to become one of his children. This baptistry behind me has been, the waters in it have been still way too long. You, this morning, if you are not a Christian, I hope that you will think carefully, prayerfully, about what you need to do when we sing the invitation song some of you need to say, time is now. I need to become a Christian. I don't need to risk my soul's salvation any longer. This song of encouragement will be for you. And you can cleanse your life now by obeying the gospel. Or you can, as a Christian who's been carrying a burden of sin, unload it. Knowing that the Father will forgive. We're going to sing the song, What Will Your Answer Be? And if you need to respond, would you come as together we stand and sing? Someday you'll stand at the bar on high. Someday your record you'll see. Someday you'll answer the question of why. What will your answer be? What will it be? What will it be? Eternity. What?
closing hymn will be the first verse of number 170. Number 170. Well, once again, on behalf of the elders, we want to thank you for choosing to be with us this morning and uh, appreciate you uh, taking the opportunity to be with us, and of course, during these times. Uh, we will encourage everyone, again, to uh, recognize safe distancing. I know it's very difficult. Uh, lots of air handshakes and air hugs. So, uh, and uh, certainly if, uh, uh, if you feel uh, the need or the desire, uh, wear your mask. I've got mine right here in my pocket. <laughs> it's not where it's supposed to be. I guess I'm supposed to have it on right now. But uh, uh, nonetheless, you know, we encourage you to take those uh, precautions if necessary. So uh, we're going to continue to try to have our services at this time each Sunday, at least on Sunday mornings, uh, as long as far as uh, uh, at this time, as far as we know. Uh, we do want you to know, as elders, we are uh, concerned about everyone's health and bringing a group of people together. And so, as things progress, hopefully uh, things will improve and we'll continue to get back to more of normalcy. Uh, if not, if things uh, worsen, then we will go back to uh, the methods that we had before. And so with that said, uh, we are live streaming our services this morning, so they will be recorded. Uh, they, uh, it will be, uh, and I do want everyone to know that if you uh, feel that you have a health condition or issues uh, or are concerned about contracting uh, the coronavirus, then please stay at home and please use uh, these services. We provide those on Facebook, we provide them on YouTube, and we also provide them on Ben Loman Channel 6 at 11 o'clock, 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings at 3.30 p.m. on Sunday afternoon and at 5 p.m. on Wednesday evening. So uh, with that as well, I uh, do want to thank Brother Tony and Jason for all of their work uh, in the last few weeks to try to put all these different things together, especially the, the services, the worship services that we've had and, and the youth services and things that uh, the classes that uh, Jason has put together. Continue to uh, encourage people to watch those. Those are still out there. Those are still there. And certainly for our young people uh, to use those for Bible study period as well while you're at home and, and still and, you know, stay at home and, and so forth. Um, do want to share with you as far as our services <coughs> Uh, we do know that uh, we did have one family who encouraged a family member in Maine, if I believe it was in Maine, to watch the virtual gospel meeting that Brother Don uh, Blackwell did for us. And uh, this was to a family member that had once been a member of God's family and had drifted away. And uh, through that virtual gospel meeting, this person responded to the gospel and was restored. And so uh, we know that God's word will not go void. And it did not go void. And there may, we have no idea how many other people uh, have had that opportunity to have those services. So we encourage you to um, encourage others to watch those, especially those who may be confined at home. Do want to remind everyone, as we do start to return again, hopefully back to normalcy, um, uh, we will have Bible study classes at some point. At this point, I did want to announce that Brother Tony will be having a marriage and the home series uh, that is set to begin the first Sunday in June, and that will be during our Bible study period each uh, Sunday morning, and that will be in our fellowship room downstairs. So at this time, we'll have a final song and a closing prayer. Uh, one housekeeping note for those that have, everyone has the packets that you've used now. If you would carry those with you, there's a trash can in the back uh, to dispose of those as you go out the door. That's a Bible class. We are going to have an auditorium. Thank you, Tony. We are going to have a Bible class for all here in the auditorium, so we encourage you to uh, stay for that. We'll begin here in about 15 minutes. Thank you. God be with you till we meet again. God. Till we meet.
Would you bow with me as we go to God in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for everything that you bless us with, for the privilege we have to come together here and to worship you, our the only true and living God. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, that there are those who have been sick, that are back, back out and able to be with us, and those that are feeling like that they should stay at home. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, that we have the, the uh, ability to stream these services to them, that they may worship you in spirit and in truth. Now go with us as we go into this Bible study period, and forgive us all when we fall short, for it's in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 